Hi everybody, it's Judith from the Vegan Vegetarian Foodie Network and I cannot believe that I have not created a video on kraut. <laughs> Sauerkraut was one of the very first ferments I learned how to make and I just did your basic recipe of cabbage, salt and water and realized that I, I, I mean I just love cabbage no matter what. I don't, it doesn't matter how it's prepared, I like cabbage. Um, if you don't like cabbage, then kraut might be a nice way to introduce you to it. Um, however, if you love cabbage, there's so many different ways of making kraut. So come and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Okay, so I have curried kraut with carrot and green cabbage. I have three cabbage kraut, which is red cabbage, green cabbage, and savoy cabbage. I have spicy hot kraut, which combines uh, habaneros with green cabbage, carrots, garlic, and onion. I have garlic dill kraut, which contains a lot of garlic, a lot of um, I believe I put fresh dill in this and some carrot and green ca uh, cabbage. Here I have turnips and beets with both red and green kraut. So grated turnip, grated beets with um, finely chopped red and green cabbage. Over here I have garlic, ginger, dill, red and green cabbage. So this is fresh dill weed. Now you'll notice that this is packed, as is this, but this is not. And ideally I would have liked to have put more water in here, but I think I took some out. So I made this loose like this because I wanted more of a kraut juice, even though all of this cabbage in here is edible. It looks like I put some ca uh, carrot in there too. Um, it might just be the cabbage, it might be, or it could be ginger. Um, so when I create kraut juice, I don't put as much cabbage in a jar. Uh, I put more liquid than I do the actual kraut. Because as you can see with this, there's not a lot of liquid in here. So you don't get a lot of kraut juice. Um, this way you get more kraut juice. And this one is probably my all time. I love garlicky dill. And this is be next to garlicky dill and the curried kraut. I'd say that this one is my um, the carrot ginger garlic garlic kraut. This one, the garlicky dill and the curried kraut are my personal favorites. This one is really nice, um, especially if you eat meat or eggs or dairy. Uh, it just adds a little bit of something. I also make um, kraut with caraway seeds and a little bit of carrot. I sometimes put just um, green cabbage and some orange slices or maybe some lemon slices or maybe some grapefruit slices. Um, I try not to get too much into the fruit and I'll only put one or two in a jar. Um, that's just to enhance the vitamin C and add a little extra. On that note, when you ferment cabbage, it magnifies the vitamin C content, uh, I think it's almost 300 fold, 100 to 300 fold depending. So red cabbage has more vitamin C than green cabbage. When you ferment red cabbage, it magnifies the vitamin C content that it has, as does when you ferment green cabbage. Adding other things such as carrots, or in this case, turnips and beets. You know, every food has its vitamin, mineral, and uh, healing benefit or nutritional value and or nutritional value to the body. And so that is magnified whenever you ferment it, which is why I absolutely love kraut because there's so many, as you can see, so many things that you can do. And let's not forget kimchi, right? I have kimchi in the back and I didn't bring it out because I've actually created a video um, which you can find on my channel just for kimchi. So I'm dedicating this video to Edith F. who 
very politely reminded me that I did not have a kraut video on my channel, which it was just like, wow, I can't believe it. So today, using some red cabbage and some green cabbage, I'm going to show you how to do a basic kraut. And as you can see, then thereafter, you just simply need to get creative. Think about all the different spices that you like. Cabbage with oregano, cabbage with basil, cabbage with rosemary, cabbage with thyme, um, cabbage with herbe de Provence. Uh, there's so many different marjoram, um, so many different spices that you can add. So if you like, if you know you already like a spice, try adding a little pinch or more to your kraut. And I would highly recommend that if you've never tried kraut before, don't go hog wild and make a full gallon. Start with just a small jar, maybe a one or two cup jar. And this also applies when you're experimenting. It's a lot more cost effective to toss out a half a cup or a cup of kraut because you don't like it or whatever than a full gallon, right? So uh, other things you can add. So this particular three cabbage kraut has carrots and it also has cranberries. So get creative that way too. You can add, and these are dried cranberries, and of course I use organic. You can add blueberries, uh, dried blueberries, dried strawberries, dried apricots. You can add prunes, dried prunes to your cabbage as well. So it's really about how experimental do you want to be? Are you willing to be an alchemist? Are you willing to be a, a mad little magician or a scientist in your kitchen? And there's no such thing as failure, okay? It's just that maybe at this point in time, if you make something, for example, it took me quite a while to get used to this spicy hot kraut because it's not what I'm used to. But when I put it as an accompaniment to meat, because I've only just started eating meat again after 20 some years in July, uh, August of this year, um, as, a, as, as a kraut with vegetables, this was a little dominant. It was very nice though with hummus, you know, like a bean uh, paste, something like a bean um, dip or a bean paste, or even with um, dairy or a paneer. Um, so dairy being, uh, sorry, paneer is a dairy, uh, or even tofu. Um, it wasn't too bad, but just to have it as, uh, for example, in a, on a lettuce wrap, which I tend to eat a lot of in the summer, or as a raw wrap, um, it was a bit dominating. It was a bit overpowering. Uh, so you need to understand for yourself your own tastes. And if it's a little overpowering, maybe don't throw it out just yet if you don't like it. Maybe, such as in my case, you just need to find the right accompaniment. Okay, so let's put this aside and I'll show you what you're gonna to need to make your basic kraut and how to do it. Before we do move on, um, this is another one that's very untraditional. So it's turmeric ginger broccoli slaw. And in here, I have your basic cabbage, right? But I've also added um, some whole garlic, some raw sliced, this is raw sliced turmeric, some uh, grated ginger. I've added some baby um, Brussels sprouts, uh, which are really just baby cabbages. They're part of the cabbage family or that, uh, yeah, they're part of the cabbage family. Um, and then broccoli. Um, so not the floret of the broccoli. You take the stem. You know, I don't waste food at all if I can avoid it. Uh, so I, I don't buy broccoli crowns. I buy the whole broccoli. I use the leaves. I cook those and eat those. Sometimes I will ferment them. Uh, sometimes I'll use them in soups. And then the stem, I, t I peel off the hard part and then I julienne um, the soft green part and I use that in my coleslaws. 
And you can do this, by the way, I, I started with, before I started fermenting cabbage, um, I was a big cabbage salad fan and I got really, really creative. And I'll create some of those videos for you as well in upcoming weeks and months to come. Um, so I got really creative with adding, you know, diced cauliflower and broccoli and just a bunch of different ingredients and uh, nuts and seeds and dried fruits, etc. Uh, and that's where um, I realized when I started fermenting, I can do that exact same salad and now ferment it, which makes it even that much more incredible. Um, if I was to eat this as an unfermented uh, kraut salad, uh, it wouldn't be a kraut, right? It would be a slaw. I wouldn't put in whole chunks of turmeric like this. I would mince the turmeric. Or you can even use turmeric powder, but then it's more of a curried. This way it's not curried, it's just a little extra something in there. And there's celery in here and a bunch of other ingredients um, as well. Now, uh, again, um, you can even use baby bok choy. Uh, so I use all sorts of different bok choy with my, um, with my cabbage, whether it's red or green, to make a coleslaw, or, uh, or in this case, a fermented kraut, right? Really, it's just a fermented coleslaw um, without all the mayonnaise, etc. <laughs> so get creative. Get really creative. Okay, so now that said, what are you going to need? You're going to need some cabbage. You're going to need some sort of salt. I use pickling salt. Now, there's a lot of controversies over salt. My biggest thing is don't use iodized salt. That's it. If you want to use um, sea salt, Celtic salt, Himalayan salt, pickling salt, coarse salt, fine salt. Knock yourself out. Just there's something about the iodine in iodized table salt that you want to avoid any sort of salt with an iodine. A lot of people have issues with things such as pickling salt and kosher salt, etc., because they're refined. Um, I don't have an issue with that because a lot of times the fermentation process, um, you know, especially when it, and I don't use organic, um, when it comes to fermentation, upwards to, one study has proven that upwards to 85% of chemicals and toxins get fermented out of the foods that are being fermented. Now, I've been doing a lot of investigative work with my body and I keep getting the same response that hormones and antibiotics do not get fermented out. So for those of you who are using your basic milk from the rack, I would highly recommend if you're doing um, milk kefir that you switch to an organic milk because the hormones and the antibiotics do not get fermented out. Okay, so you're going to need some sort of salt. You're going to need some sort of vessel. I got um, a bunch of these the other day. I was at Walmart. Uh, this particular is a half gallon. I picked it up for, I think, $5.77 $5 Canadian. So for those of you who are in the States, you'll probably, your dollar is stronger than ours. It might be uh, less costly for you. Although $5.77 I thought was a real steal. You're going to need some sort of uh, food grade quality container. So I have a food grade quality bucket here. I think it's uh, three quarts uh, just because my all my other containers are full. And you're going to obviously need knives or a food processor or something to chop your cabbage. Now I'm only going to make this much so I'm not going to use a whole head of cabbage. Just as an FYI, this is a, looks like about an 8 inch cabbage. This entire cabbage, if done properly, will fill a one gallon jar. Just so that you know, okay? So if you are wanting to mix a, green, a red cabbage with a green cabbage, and this one looks like it's about 10 or 12 inches, just know that this would probably, at least, if you're not adding any other ingredients, be two gallons of from finished kraut. So I'm only going to use a quarter of the red today and a quarter of the green. I save the outside leaves. I wash them and I save them. And then 
I will ferment just the leaves, the outside leaves. Um, and what I'll do with the outside leaves is I'll make cabbage rolls with them. Or I will make, um, I will use these, if I don't ferment them, I'll use them over top of other ferments. So let's say I like fermented bean sprouts. Whether it's mung bean sprouts or soybean sprouts, um, I try to buy the organic ones. Um, I will put this over top, or if I'm doing fermented, um, uh, let's see, what else do I do? Oh, sort of like salads. I do fermented salads um, using different types of sprouts, uh, alfalfa sprouts, broccoli sprouts, pea sprouts, etc. And so I'll take some of this cabbage, raw cabbage, and use it instead of a weight over top. So these cabbage leaves, outer cabbage leaves, you'll notice a lot of people, at least I do at the grocery store where I go to, they peel all the outer cabbages off and the grocery store has a big box underneath and they toss them. And I just go, oh my gosh, I'd like to take that box home because what I could do with those cabbage leaves is unbelievable, but each to their own. So I buy cabbage with the nice green leaves, I just make sure I wash them. So something to keep in mind, okay? If you've always bought cabbage that's nice and tight and bright red and it doesn't have a lot of that external, you might find now that you're starting to look for this type of a cabbage. And yes, it's dirty, but you just wash it. No big deal. So you'll notice this has a, it's blemished. I'm not going to keep this. This to me, I will feed to my, I have a vermicompost, meaning I have little red wiggler worms in a stackable uh, compost, and I feed them scraps. They get, um, they get a lot of fermented st uh, foods as well as scraps like this that are not edible for me. Um, for outer cabbage leaves, when, and yes, you if you if you didn't think you heard that correctly about, I said I use these, I ferment these whole cabbage leaves and I make cabbage rolls. I make raw fermented cabbage rolls and I have a recipe for that on this channel so you can find that. Of course, you can always use these outer leaves for unfermented cabbage rolls uh, as well, right? Um, when I do fermented cabbage rolls, so, this stem that's in here, the spine of the cabbage, I will cut that out. Sorry, when I, when I don't ferment it, I will cut that out. But when I'm actually fermenting it, I leave that spine in because that gets soft and it's edible and it's more pliable. Like you'll notice, see, I can't roll it, right? Because it snaps and that's why when I, I use a, um, an unfermented raw cabbage leaf for a cabbage roll, I cut that spine out. But when I'm doing a fermented, a full ferm, and I do a full ferment um, cabbage roll, meaning that I ferment the rice as well before I put it in here. Um, so I will leave that spine in. Similarly, if I'm using this uh, to put on top of another ferment such as you know um, fermented zucchini or fermented broccoli or fermented cauliflower or um, my dill pickles my fermented dill pickles or anything like that then again I will cut this spine out because I'm putting the leaf in raw and so I will chop it up like this and put in the pieces like this so no spine now that said uh, the spines are still fermentable, so don't toss them unless, of course, you want to throw them in your vermicompost or your compost. Just chop them up really super fine and add it to your kraut. To ferment the whole cabbage leaves, you're going to need a large vessel. This is a, a one gallon. Remember I showed you I had the one that's a half a gallon? This is a full gallon. I picked it up for $7.77 Canadian. And I'm going to add approximately a tablespoon or more of the salt. And I've just packed the leaves in without breaking the spines. So let's take a... There's, there's a cabbage leaf that's about three quarters, right? So take that off. And it's 
a little bit broken, but that's okay. Just sort of fold it into the spine and then shove it down into your jar. Even this piece, you can make a cabbage roll with that. Shove it in there. So this will be like your, I call it a cabbage hotel, or your um, cabbage leaf hotel, I should say, uh, for your cabbage rolls. Again, here's another nice piece, just sort of tucking the leaf into the stem so you don't break the stem. And it's okay if you break the stem. I mean, it's not a big deal. It's not going to be the end of the world. It's a first world problem, not a third world problem. So not a big deal. And uh, again, you want to put as many into the jar as will fit comfortably or as many as you think you want to eat. So I probably got at least a dozen in there. That's perfect for now because that'll be enough cabbage rolls for Dom and I for now. Um, so the salt's in there and now you want to add the water. And the beautiful thing about this, when you're doing the leaves, is now this liquid is your kraut juice. So it's a great way to make kraut juice without chopping up your kraut, as I mentioned in the previous, um, just to have kraut juice, right? So let's add some water. And of course you don't massage it. You don't have to massage the cabbage, right? You don't want to, as a matter of fact. And just pouring that water in there. I'm going to have to get another jar. Yep. And so the most important thing with this is just to make sure that the cabbage is submerged, right? So I have a good inch of head space there. All the cabbage is, is submerged. And yes, you can do this with red cabbage as well. But again, um, just remember what I had said. If you, uh, the, the purple cabbage, if you're thinking of combining, the purple cabbage will leach out some of the, the color which will leach into the green cabbage. It'll change the color. Not a big deal, but if you want to present a nice green cabbage roll, then just keep your greens in one jar and maybe make another jar just for your red cabbage. Put a lid on it. Don't forget to put a lid on it. And again, you might want to label it. Um, when you made it just you know so that you know now how long will it take for these cabbage leaves to ferment again um, it might take a little longer depending on the temperature right because temperature has a lot to do with it so ideally uh, I leave them in here for at least a month uh, in my back room and then I find they're ready um, if it's cold winter because I live in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. It can be really cold in here. My back room gets really super cold because I leave the window wide open uh, in the winter. Uh, and I do that because I have a lot of my... Um, I will not show you my back room by the way because I'm kind of embarrassed by it. It's... Um, if I did show you, you'd understand why. But I just... It's basically... It's an entire size kitchen full of food. Uh, and in addition to my kitchen. So I have all my potatoes and my pumpkins. I buy everything in made, I bought, I stock up. I majorly stock up. Like, you know, I'll buy 30 or 40 pounds of potatoes for the winter. I'll buy 60 pounds of onions for the winter. Um, I buy bags and bags of rice and beans and store them in food grade quality buckets. And it's, it's a little bit uh, chaotic back there right now too. The reason why I keep the window open in the winter is so that it's cold enough to that my potatoes and my garlic and my onions and all those things, my squashes, my pumpkins will last. In, essentially I make it into a cold cellar even though I'm on the third floor. It's like a cold cellar. So because of that, this particular cabbage uh, may take upwards to three months to ferment. Again, temperature, indoor temperature is vital. So obviously if I wanted this to ferment faster, I would bring it out to the kitchen where my kitchen is probably the warmest, one of the warmest rooms in my house. Um, and I might even put it, I have the old hot water, this building that I live in is about 80 to 100 years old. It has the old hot water style heaters. Um, and so I might put this up against the hot water heater if I want it to, fer to ferment a little faster. And I, again, I can wrap it in a cozy, you know, 
know, like a little tea cloth or something, and that will help it to ferment faster. Uh, some people use heating pads. Um, I've had a conversation online uh, with uh, a lady recently. Um, I see the pros and cons to it. Um, it's up to you, but I find um, a towel, wrapping it in a towel or a couple of nice big thick terry cloth towels is quite uh, beneficial. And secure it with elastic. Um, and that goes for kombucha in particular because um, uh, kombucha um, likes to be nice and warm without being hot to ferment. Okay, so let's move on. So just to be sure I'm not misunderstood, the only reason why I'm using a food grade quality container is to mix, to massage the kraut. I am not going to ferment in a food grade quality plastic container for a couple reasons and I want to share why. First of all, my body is far too sensitive to chemicals. I know a lot of people are only concerned about the BPA in plastic, but plastic is all of the plastic except for the water to make it, which becomes toxic because of the chemicals that they use to make it. This is 100% pure toxin for your body, even if it's food grade quality, which is why I personally would never, ever, ever ferment anything in a food grade quality plastic. So think about your feta cheese, right? It comes in a plastic container, which is why I stopped buying feta cheese. Because I don't want that. I don't, I don't care it's, whether it's a foreign plastic that I don't know what the name is or if it's BPA. I know that my body has an adverse reaction. I'm very sensitive to toxins. So I only use it to mix. When I ferment, I only use glass containers. And it can be a brand new glass jar, or it can be something that I bought another something in it. So this, I think, had pickles or something in it one, once. I save all my glass jars. I recycle and reuse them for my ferments because I don't need an airtight, secure lid when I'm doing a ferment contrary to a lot of the uh, notions out there, you don't need it. Um, you just need to make sure that it's relatively airtight. When you're doing canning, which involves a vinegar solution and you have to bathe it, such as sauce or jams and things like that, then you want an airtight seal. That's a different process. So you would need a different type of make sure that you have a, a quality seal, right? So any kind of glass, as long as it's clean and as long as it's uh, big enough um, for you to do your ferments. Now when it comes to kraut, just as, as an FYI, you'll notice that this is a small diameter and this is a large so they call this wide mouth and they call this regular and this again is a wide mouth I find when it comes to ferments uh, unless I'm doing like whole cauliflower broccoli whole carrots the smaller lid is okay for that when you're doing kraut well just think about it right you're trying to get a, something in there to pull it out and I typically just use my hands because I don't, other than wood, I try not to touch ferments with any other, with anything else. Um, again, because plastic and metals leach into, even if, you know, even if it's just for a few seconds, it's not going to be a lot, but I'm, again, I'm sensitive to that. And you might be as well. If you're not, then you can just ignore what I'm saying. Um, however, for me to put my hands in here, I can, trust me, I can get my whole hand in there because I'm like a cat, I can move my uh, bones in my hand to fit in there. Um, however, um, not comfortable, not the best, not the most ideal. So when you're fermenting, especially kraut, um, at least this is my, my experience, best to have something that you can actually get your hand in. So a nice wide mouth. Okay. Again, it's personal preference. You might not care. You might just stick a fork in and, hey, if that's your thing, then that's your thing. Who am I to tell you? But I do need to share 
for those of you who um, I receive a lot of feedback from that are that I know are chemically sensitive this is great for mixing but please don't ferment in it okay so um, did you know that you can ferment an, a whole cabbage and again you would not want to ferment in a ideally in a food grade plastic container but there's lots of big jars that, glass jars that you can buy that you can put a whole cabbage in and ferment and why would you do that because again then the whole cabbage is fermented and all you have to do is peel off one leaf at a time and you can do um, you can have fermented cabbage leaves for cabbage rolls as opposed to you know what I'm going to do I'm going to take the, the uh, which I've done I've taken the outer leaves off and I'm going to ferment each leaf you know singularly as opposed to like the entire cabbage and also um, then if the entire cabbage is fermented you know you just slice it you can make steaks with it and again <laughs> steaks uh, they can be raw fermented or sometimes um, you know we ferment for probiotics right and because it enhances the nutritional value of the food and it makes it easier makes it more bio the nutrients more bioavailable in the body it makes it the food that we're fermenting easier to digest because it breaks down the starches the sugars the proteins the fats etc um, however if you're on a paleo a low carb um, a ketosis diet then fermenting foods and let's say this whole cabbage was fermented and I wanted to make a cabbage steak I can slice this get a nice big cabbage steak and fry it because at that point the probiotics are less important to me if I'm on a ketosis a paleo or a low carb diet than the probiotics besides I can always add probiotics to this already fermented and then cooked cabbage steak right if I'm gonna make a cabbage steak type thing so something to think about fermenting foods provides two wonderful opportunities one like I mentioned it's to make the nutrients more bioavailable and to allow your body to receive probiotics the other is to diminish reduce eliminate the sugars the starches the carbs and consequently the calories so that it's a low carb food for you which is makes it amazing especially if you're on a ketosis diet um, you can have all the vegetables in the world uh, on a ketosis diet with virtually no sugar by fermenting it first and you can cook it it doesn't matter like I for example I have fermented potatoes I love potatoes I love fries I love potatoes but a lot of sugar and I'm on a ketosis diet so um, and my body needs 95 percent fermented foods I fermented this whole potato I did a whole jar you'll see that video and then I baked it so this has no sugar no starch and of course it has no probiotics but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this open and I'm going to stuff it with probiotics and I'm going to eat that so it's a wonderful way for me on a ketosis diet low carb ketosis diet to still enjoy the benefits of eating potatoes and cabbage and beets and carrots you know all those vegetables that are high in sugar and starches sweet potatoes um, um, squash all sorts of different squashes I still can eat them on this on this uh, diet for lack of a better word and still have probiotics because I will simply like I said the toppings will all be probiotic I will have probiotic sour uh, kefir sour cream I will have um, some I might put uh, my avocado spread on this I might put I might even stuff this with some kraut this is awesome a potato with kraut and then a little bit of fermented sour cream on top so you know keep that in mind as well okay so let me chop some of this I'll chop some of this uh, and put it in here and I'll tell you how much salt and I'll show you what to do I'm going to try and stabilize my camera here 
And again, I'm just going to do a little bit. Um, so this is what I was talking about as a cabbage steak. Now typically people would take this and they would oil it and season it and then bake it. By the way, it's absolutely delicious like that. If, however, not everyone can eat raw cabbage, it causes gas. That's why fermenting is such a beautiful um, way to be able to incorporate cabbage into your diet that otherwise would not allow you to do that. Uh, braised cabbage is another one. I will sometimes slice this all up and then cook it in a cast iron frying pan with some oil and some uh, other vegetables, like a stir fry almost type. Um, another delicious way to, to eat it. And again, I can do this once it's fully fermented or I can do it raw, right? Um, so that's all I'm going to do. And, and I do, I still like to, I'm of that old school where I still like to um, do everything by hand. And yes, you know, I, I don't, <laughs> I'm not fussy about what tools. Everybody says, oh my God, you know, like you're using a bread knife to cut your cabbage. That's for bread. You know, we seem to have this allocation for things. Uh, if you're new to cooking, my theory is this. If it works for you, do it. And if it doesn't, then find a tool that does. So, you know, I have this tool. You can use this tool as well. You can use your sakuto knife. You can use your vegetable knife. Whatever works for you, that's the most important thing. Try not to get caught up in, you know, the right way and the wrong way and the right tools and etc. Personally, I like my bread knife. So cutting it nice and thin, as thin as you can. You might want to cut this in chunks. Is there a right way and a wrong way to cut cabbage? I don't know. I don't think so, but there are some cultures that you're not allowed to mix your peas with your carrots, and you're not allowed to do this and that. I guess it all depends on what you believe. Okay, so I've got some cabbage, green cabbage. Now let's add some red. Same thing. I'm not going to bore you with the details. I'll pre-chop this and come back. Voila. You know, um, <laughs> I kind of went on a rant there. Sorry, guys. I just think that, you know, let's let Gordon Ramsay and, and Rachel Ray and all the chefs out there, I don't know who they all are, Jamie Oliver, let's let them be chefs, right? Uh, and let, let's appreciate them for the culinary crafts and skills and gifts and capacities that they offer us in the world. But let's be realistic about who we are. If you're not a Chef Ramsay, you're not a Chef Ramsay. You're a you. You're not a Jamie Oliver. You're not a Rachel Ray. Just be you and be real and be the best that you can be with the tools that you have. And if people make fun of that, well then that's their point of view. It's not yours. It just reveals that they have a limited way of thinking, I guess. You know, they have a right way and a wrong way of thinking. But if it works for you, do it. This is um, not even half a cabbage, so I'm only going to add uh, a tablespoon of salt and sorry, a teaspoon of salt, and then I'm going to massage it. And that's the whole purpose of the food grade. It can be, um, whether it's glass or plastic, a food grade quality container that you can massage your kraut. And the purpose of massaging your kraut, your cabbage, is, especially with when adding the salt, is, you know, and you can do it before you add the salt, it's just that salt helps break it down better. 
um, you want to release the juices that are naturally inherent in the cabbage. Uh, cabbage contains a lot of water, but you don't have access to it until you massage it out of it. It's kind of like kale. You know, a wilted kale salad is delicious. Uh, you take the kale and you massage it. But if you sit down, like this cabbage leaf, if you try to sit down and just gnaw on this cabbage leaf, it's going to be fibrous and tough. And so when you massage it, it releases the water, it softens it, and um, then you don't have to add water to your kraut. You don't have to massage it. Trust me, I've made kraut many times where I've just thrown it in a jar. The disadvantage to that is that you can't stuff as much cabbage into a jar and you have to add a whole lot more water, which is why when I showed you that one jar, that is what I did because I wanted more water. I wanted more kraut juice as opposed to actual kraut. So purpose place, decide on what your intention is when you're making the kraut. Is it because you want to eat the kraut and have a little bit of juice? Or are you trying to make kraut juice with a little bit of kraut, right? So you want to massage this for a good three to five minutes. And you might want to alternate your hands or get other people involved, make sure their hands are clean, especially under the nails. And um, once it's ready, we'll stuff it into the jar. Because I have such little cabbage, this half gallon is going, jar is going to be far too big. My body told me that um, I can fit all of this into this 18 ounce glass jar. So that's what I'm going to do. And again, this is a small mouth jar. It's not ideal. Uh, you ideally, if you're working with um, kraut in particular, you want what's called a kraut pounder. There's a couple different kraut pounders. This is one. This is only for wide mouth. And then this one is made from a wood. It has a, both a small mouth and a wide mouth, so it's dual. 20 bucks on Amazon, at least $20 Canadian. Uh, so that's where I got that, and I'd highly recommend that you have a dual. This one was gifted to me, very grateful for that. However, this one for my life is more practical uh, because I work with jars of all, all different sizes. Now, at this point, this is where you'd want to add in after it's massaged whatever other ingredients you're going to add, whether that's cabbage, broccoli, uh, sorry, uh, bok choy, and actually I would massage uh, the bok choy and or the Brussels sprouts, I would massage it with the cabbage. But if you're going to add uh, grated carrot, if you're going to add some broccoli, cauliflower, uh, turmeric, ginger, um, fruit, dried fruit, uh, seasoning, any sort of seasoning, herbs, spices, etc. This is where you want to add it before you transfer it to the jar. And of course the reason for that is because um, there's no right way and no wrong way, like I said, right? There's, however, um, it's easier to massage the cabbage on its own first and then add onto because those ingredients, it's not required that they be massaged. So I think for this here, I'm simply going to add a pinch of Italian seasoning. So I have mixed Italian herbs. It's called Italian seasoning. I make my own, but you can buy it pre-mixed. And I think I'm going to add some chopped up garlic to this. So I have about six garlic cloves that I've just roughly chopped. And I'm going to add that and mix it up just lightly and start, I want you to be able to see this, start packing it into the jar. And every now and then, you're going to take the small, because this is a small mouth, you're going to take the end of your kraut pounder, and you can take this off if you want, and just pound it down gently, 
press down hard but not too hard that you break the glass because yes that can happen too trust me I've done it all and then add more and then stop press it down again and sorry I can't stabilize my camera guys you know I get a lot of criticism for my camera but just as an FYI I'm using a Canon Power Shot on a stick and I shoved it down the front of my bra which is why I'm behind you hear my voice clearly and you see as I see it so I don't I'm I'm alone I'm solo here my husband doesn't video record for me I don't have people to do that I don't have a tri I have tripods but I'm not technologically advanced I'm not gonna lie um, so I just do Remember I was saying you just do the best you can? Well, this is me. Uh, I, I'm not, um, not going to pretend to be a film creator. <laughs> My forte is this, you know. I'm also a writer. I'm not a publisher. So I'm not going to pretend to be a publisher, but I can write. So I can create foods. But yeah, my weakness is, is uh, obviously in the filming. So the camera gets shaky, and I apologize for all that. But now you know why, right? And hopefully you can have a little kindness towards me when my quality of filming sucks. And ideally, when you keep pushing down, you'll see that the liquid starts to come up. And I yeah, there it's starting to come up. Let's see if I can show you from here. Do you see that? Do you see the liquids there? Maybe not. There, you can see it there. Okay, as it comes up to the top more, you'll see it. You know, <laughs> being in the kitchen, I don't know about you guys, but being in the kitchen... Uh, playing with food, and that's really all it is for me. Playing with food. I was never one of those kids that played Barbie dolls or dolls. I was one of the. I was a Tommy girl. I used to be in the sandbox playing with cars, and I love road construction. I love construction in general. Probably why I married a man that's in construction. And um, I. Uh, this just reminds me of playing in the sandbox. You know, and playing with the dirt. So, did you see the liquid there? There we go. That's what we want. Because then when you have all that liquid, you don't have to add water. Now that's why I say the difference between kraut, right? Making kraut versus making kraut juice. Kraut juice, you would use less cabbage. You'd add more water. But when you're making kraut, you don't add water. You allow the juices of the, of the cabbage to be the water. See, there you go. Beautiful, right? Now I'm going to tell you all right now, I already know because I've been doing this for years and years and years, this is going to overflow. So you definitely, when you see that, even though I have about a, an inch, not even a half an inch head space, this is going to overflow. So to prevent that, because I don't want to lose any of that beautiful, delicious liquid, I can either move this into a bigger jar or I can keep, and I might actually come back here. I might just keep pounding the, pulverizing this until it's way down there. So if that's the case, and you know it's going to spill while you're doing it, get something underneath that'll catch it. Yeah, there we go, it's starting to catch. And I'm just going to keep pressing down because I can always spill. The glass is clean. My container underneath is clean. I can always pour that water back in if I need it. I just want to get that cabbage pressed down far enough because it's not going to submerge. It's not going to move once it's pressed down. The only thing that's going to happen is that the water will start to seep over when it ferments. That's ideal right there. I've got a good inch of headspace, so I don't need this ex excess water. Because all the cabbage is submerged, I don't need a cabbage leaf. All I need to do, because it's overflowed, is clean up the edge, put a lid on it, not tight, you don't want it super tight, and clean up the jar. 
and voila there's your kraut now here's the thing when you combine um, okay first of all when you ferment red cabbage it starts to lose that purple color because that color then spreads out and so with the finished product your green won't look so green it'll look kind of pinkish and so will the red cabbage so the colors merge the red seeps into the green and it bleeds out of uh, or the purple I guess seeps out of the cabbage so just keep that in mind it's not going to look as pretty as it does when you first make it but boy oh boy is it delicious um, you can use less for this size of jar you can probably go with a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon of salt for those of you on a sodium restricted diet um, however you can go up to a tablespoon of salt if you put more than a tablespoon of salt in a jar of this size it might be a little too salty especially if you're new to fermenting um, so I always say start with less and slowly build up to more if you want put a label on it you might even want to date it because if you're like me you'll just throw it in the back room and forget about it leave it on the counter for a couple days you still might want to have something under it because it it may seep over you know that's all to do with temperature in your house on how fast it ferments and how quickly it seeps over and even if it does quick uh, seep over um, so you know if your house is 70 to 73 degrees that's ideal if it's warmer it's going to take a lot less time to ferment so maybe only a couple days out in the counter and then throw it in the fridge and forget about it or you can eat it right away I mean you can eat it after a couple days um, I like my cabbage really soft which is why I like to ferment mine my back room is quite cool usually it's about 66 degrees and so I will leave this back there for about a month before I even consider eating it uh, on hot summer days I don't have air conditioning in my home I prefer not to have air conditioning uh, it can be a hundred degrees back there and so basically at the end of the day this will be done um, and so I have to you know your environment you have to be mindful of your environment if your place is cold and you want it fermented faster you can wrap it in um, a tea towel or a thick terry cloth towel secure it with an elastic on the outside just just know that um, it might seep over so don't be attached to your towel it can always be washed right and maybe that'll be a towel that you designate just for fermenting um, but uh, it will add, it will act as an insulator um, and you can even wrap it uh, in a towel and then put it either in a cardboard box or a uh, insulated food you know the insulated food bags that you get by the grocery stores or even a cooler uh, the problem with the cooler though is it tends to cool things right so if you put it in a cooler bag with the towel wrapped around it it kind of holds in the warmth so that's a way that you can help to speed up the fermentation of it if if your place is too cold so again label it you might want to date it even um, I would recommend that you label it on the top because when it seeps over that will ruin your label once it's fully finished seeping over then you can put the label here but I can almost assure you if you really like it that label is not going to be required because you'll probably eat it within no time that is how you make kraut I hope you've enjoyed this video as much as I've enjoyed making it kraut is one of my most favorite foods um, in, at least in the fermentation world uh, so lots of different ideas and recipes hey by the way if there's things that you do let's say you've been making kraut recently or you've been making it for years and you have a recipe by all means please I mean this is a community we're a community here we're here to teach each other to learn from each other to share share your recipe in the in the comments below and you know be an incentive for someone else to try something different so thanks for watching liking and sharing this video and if you haven't yet subscribed and you're enjoying this video subscribe now until I see you in the next video. Ciao for now, guys.